Uh, I want to, though, introduce our next speaker, Jeremy Patterson. Um, he does, he's an interactive architect and web developer and game designer. Uh, he's been uh, working on games for quite a long time, and he has a very storied and long uh, understanding of different tool sets and uh, different ways to go about developing games, thinking about game development, and how to find ways to make the best use of your time. So if everybody could welcome Jeremy Patterson up. Okay, it's working good. Um, full disclosure, this is the largest audience I've ever spoken to, so I'm using the old trick of imagining all of you in your underwear right now. I'm sorry. Calming myself down. No, it's working. Don't be sorry about it. So, all right, so my presentation today, what I wanted to do was give you a presentation that made you as enthusiastic about some of the tools and opportunities that are available today um, as I am about them. Because one of the first things that came to my mind when asked to do this presentation was, you know, of course I'm enthusiastic about um, this current day and age. And the reason that I'm enthusiastic about it is, uh, for the first time ever, I can go out on my own and create and make a game that runs on something like this. And for me, personally, that's always kind of been the gold standard of when we've arrived is when I can make something that runs on this. And I've always been you know, trying to reach that goal even when it was you know, completely out of reach. And what I started thinking about was, you know, this has been my personal gold standard, um, and it's been my infatuation, uh, almost a borderline fetish of being able to you know, make a game that runs on this thing. And what I realized was is that I didn't have an explanation on why I had that motivation, why I had that feeling. And if I can't explain it to myself, I can't stand up here and explain it to any of you guys either. So what I started to do is I started to do some digging and some thinking. And thinking about history of the industry, history of uh, different media, and then also history of myself as a personal history. So what I want to do today is I want to kick things off um, by talking about some of that history. So some of it's going to be my history, some of it's going to be um, industry history, media history in general. And then use that as a segue into some of the tools that are available to all of you right now um, that really make this a, a golden age for this industry in particular. Um, so a little bit of uh, personal background on me. You know, growing up, I, I would describe my family as being um, middle class by the definition of middle class. So we never had a lot of money, and we never starved. We always had enough money to, to get by. But what that meant was is that growing up, I never had a computer. That wasn't my introduction to games. That wasn't anything that I had available to me. My parents were teachers, so every summer my dad would bring home his computer from school, and I'd get to play with it there. But my main introduction to uh, games and the gaming industry and video games were actually through things like this, so game consoles. So the first game console that I ever got was Pong. Um, my mom got it for me when we were kids, and my sister and I sat in our bedroom and endlessly played that thing. There was no pause on Pong, if you remember. It was before pause was invented and introduced to the industry. But we did figure out if we arranged the paddles in a specific way, the ball would just bounce in between them. And so then we could get up and have a bathroom break, and everything was all good. So after that, this was the next system that I had the... Um, honor and privilege of having when I was a kid, and it's a ColecoVision. So ColecoVision, you know, looking out in the audience, there's probably a lot of people that are young enough that you've probably never seen this thing before. Um, but it was, the graphics on this thing were insane. It was so good. And uh, one of the other unique things that happened with this was they came out with a, there's a little slot in the front, and they came out with an expansion module that you could plug into the front of it. And that expansion module lets you buy Atari 2600 games and play it in a competing console, which if you think about that now, you know, can you imagine you know, Sony coming out with an expansion module and you could play Nintendo games in it? You know, it's not, not going to happen. Um, but they had this thing, and that came out around the same time as the video game Crash of 83. So you could go to a drugstore, and they'd have these huge bins of boxed Atari 2600 games that you could buy for you know, 10 cents a piece. So I just loaded up on those things, and this was you know, my main conduit into to starting to play games. I mean, one of my early 
earliest memories was um, we had aptitude tests in kindergarten, and I remember thinking, I need to study for that aptitude test. So I played a marathon session of Smurfs on ColecoVision to do that. I don't think it really helped me on my tests, but... Um, so then, after this system, the next one that I got that I held near and dear to my heart was, of course, the Nintendo Entertainment System. Um, I got this for Christmas one year. I actually had originally wanted a Sega Master System, but somehow Santa Claus knew that this was the better system, and I did get the right one in the end, so, so that all worked out very well. So I'm not embarrassed to say that playing games and playing uh, video games on these consoles was a major part of my life as a kid. You know, I was, uh, I was a dork, I was a nerd, and I spent tons and tons of time playing on these things. And... You know, for me, the kind of the natural progression for that was, you know, I play a lot of games on these things. I want to make my own games for these things. You know, I spent a lot of time doing this. I should be able to, to build my own game, design my own game, and have it run on there. So I did just that. And I, the other night, I went down into the Patterson archives in my house, which is a portfolio binder of all my old stuff that my mom dumped off on me not too long ago. And I pulled out some of the old game designs that I had. And so I wanted to show some of these to you. This one I wanted to show to you because it completely blew my mind going through it. Um, I did this one before I could write. So it doesn't have any words in it, but it has a, a, a game where you encounter a different um, obstacle or a different alien. You have to figure out the puzzle to get past to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. But the whole story is told with no words. And it's actually pretty long, so I didn't um, capture all the different scenes from it. Um, but one of the thing, one thing in particular, really uh, kind of blew my mind with this. So, so you go through, and this is an example of one of the one of the scenarios. You're captured by some kind of alien, and um, then you have to figure out the puzzle and get into the pond and swim past them and all this stuff. And uh, I vaguely remembered uh, writing or drawing some of this, but I didn't remember the story as a whole. And so the story goes through, and at the end, you end up escaping everything, and you run into this hut. And it's kind of illuminated, and it's just the end shot of the hut. And when you walk in, there's a cake sitting there for you. So I came to the realization that somehow, you know, my idea for this game of somebody going through trials and puzzles and then getting cake at the end was somehow stolen. So if this presentation makes it out and Gabe Newell is listening, I'm coming after you because you owe me some money. So... Um, so this was one example of it, and then later on, you know, I learned how to write, so I came up with this, um, this game, which, in case any of you are wondering, this one hasn't been made yet, so if you're looking for some pretty hot IP to start off on, Dragons and Treasure is available. Um, and as the name implies, this is a game about dragons and treasure. And if you couldn't gather that from the name, I also had the objective written up. Um, the objective is to kill the dragon and get the treasure. So... <laughs> There's a series of different frames here that you go through, um, obstacles. Some of the things have point values for the treasure that you pick up. Um, so going through them. And then at the end, of course, you battle the dragon and win the game and get the treasure. Uh, I also started working on my pixel art at this time, apparently, um, preparing myself for actually making this game and putting it on console. So what's the problem with this? Well, I went through and, you know, dreamed about all these things that I wanted to do on these consoles, but you know, at the time, you can't get these on a console. So I found that out really quick, and it's kind of like having your dream you know, die at a certain point. So I did what I could. I was a member of the Nintendo Fan Club, and when the first issue of Nintendo Power came out, it shipped to me free. And so Nintendo Power was great because it was one of the first... It, it was almost like a, you know, let's be, let's be realistic about it. It was a brochure or uh, advertisement for Nintendo. Um, but it did have a lot of stuff about games in it. It had the whole section where you could take a picture of your high score on your TV screen and send it in, and they would list you in the magazine. Um, and then at the end of every issue, they had a page that listed out the addresses of all the game companies that were currently making games. So Konami, Ultra, um, Data East, Trade West, Nintendo, they were all in there. So what I did was I figured that eventually I was going to have you know, the killer game idea and I needed to have contacts in the industry. So I got the only thing that I could program, which was a Casio databank watch with 50 slots in it. And I went through and I put 
all of the addresses, phone numbers um, of the game companies and the back of Nintendo Power into my watch because I didn't have you know business contacts to put in there and I didn't have a Rolodex at the time. So, so that's what I did in the hopes that you know someday I would be able to a- approach Konami and say, hey, I have this great idea for Dragons and Treasure, and I think you should make it. But that never that never manifested. That never happened. Um, but what did end up happening around that same time is there was there was a shift that occurred. Um, in a couple different industries. Um, one of them was a little bit more subtle. Uh, one of them ended up being a little bit more overt. Uh, but there were devices that were introduced around that time um, that took a lot of activities that were sometimes social, non-private activities um, that you had to do in a specific space and made them something personal. And the first device that I can think of that did that for me and did that for a lot of people was the Sony Walkman. And when you think about this, this is really revolutionary because it took the act of listening to music and made it something that you, know, you didn't have to sit in your living room with your speakers on and disturb everybody in the house and listen, listen to your music. You could put a tape in your Walkman, put your headphones on, and it went with you. It was part of your life. It was part of the context of, of your life. Um, it's almost like you know, what a paperback novel is to literature the Walkman is to music. It makes it a really personal thing. And once you start having something that's with you like that, that you're sharing that experience with, it becomes, um, you know, I hate to say it, but it becomes your companion. It becomes something that's part of your life. And think back, think of your, you know, cell phone. You know, that's really, for all intents and purposes, your companion. It's part of your life. Um, Whether you like it or not, it it is. Um, So Sony came out with this, the Walkman, and then around the same time, Nintendo came out with this, which is the Game Boy. And the Game Boy was kind of the same thing, but for games. I mean, it was something that you know, I would take with me everywhere. I always had it in my backpack. It just became a part of, of my life. It was my companion. It was my, my friend. You know, I, I had a very personal relationship with it. And this photo right here, I think, speaks volumes about that personal relationship that people build up with these, these devices. Um, this is the Gulf War Game Boy. And this Game Boy went to the Gulf War with a soldier, obviously saw some action, got damaged, um, but it still plays. But this was part of that soldier's life. He took it with him. Um, it was his companion over there, and he you know, evidently always had it with him and, and used it. Um, so this brings me back to, you know, you have these devices that are really personal to you. They're part of you. Um, and for me, that, of course, means that I want to be able to make something that works on these devices. So let's think about a Walkman really quick. So you want to make something that plays back in a Walkman. Well, that's actually pretty straightforward. So you go ahead and you go to um, the guitar store. You buy a guitar. You learn how to play guitar. You get some friends together. They learn how to play different instruments. Um, You write some songs. You record them. And then you put them on a tape and put it in your Walkman. And bam, you're listening to your content. Um, Game Boy... Not so straightforward. Uh, what you could do was, you know, at the time, you could use the um, internet that really hadn't been invented yet, and you could do a search to find an EEPROM cart that you could reprogram, and then you could use your um, computer with your imaginary dev kit on it that you got from Nintendo somehow, and write your game and flash it onto the cart. And then you can go back to Nintendo or one of the publishers who are the ones that are licensed to put stuff on the device, and you can beg them and say, hey, I want my official Nintendo seal so that I can put it on a cartridge and put it in a Game Boy and play it. Um, I think needless to say, you know, no, none of this is going to happen, especially for, you know, me as a kid growing up in the 80s. So what does this leave me at? Well, this leaves me at a point where, you know, Every place that you turn when you're trying to realize a dream, you're being told no at every step of the way. And Game Boy wasn't necessarily the only uh, mobile game device out there. This was the first one that I had. It was a Game & Watch. And trying to build a game for this is even more difficult. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to go out and get a LCD liquid crystal display and etch your own template for it. and you know, it's, That's not going to happen. So no, you're not going to make anything for this. Uh, Tiger, well, this isn't a Tiger Electronics, but another Game Watch. Um, Tiger Electronics came out with a bunch of handhelds at the same time, you know, personal devices. Are you going to build content for this? No, you can't do that. You don't have access to the tools to be able to do it. You don't have access to be able to actually put it on the device. So no, every step of the way. 
And so this is where kind of a grand conflict begins with me. So both as a, as a personality thing and as a, a principle, as a moral principle. The first one is a personality thing and that, um, you know, growing up, and I've gotten better about this over the years, uh, being told, no, you can't do something, just made me want to turn around and try to do it. So it was not a, not a good thing to do. So you tell me, you know, no, you can't walk through that wall. I'm going to spend the next three hours trying to walk through that wall. And like I said, I've toned down a bit. So at the question and answer section, don't ask me if I can walk through that wall or tell me, no, I can't, because I, I won't try doing it. Um, but I don't think I'm alone in that. I mean, I think it's, you know, very off-putting to have somebody that has that kind of access, that kind of control, tell you, no, you, you can't do that. And not only is it off-putting in, kind of a, um, in that sense, but I think it also violates uh, a, a core principle that I hold dear. And that core principle is what I've termed the Ratatouille principle. And this is the very serious part of the talk. Um, so this is the Ratatouille principle, very important. Now, but the reason that I, that I coined it this is because there's a line in this movie that I think sums this up uh, the best. And it's the line that says, uh, not everybody can be a great chef, but a great chef can come from anywhere. Um, I firmly believe that. I think you know, not everybody is going to make the, great, the best great new game, um, but that great new game can come from anywhere. That idea can come from anywhere. And I think you know, by limiting people's access to the means of production, the means of distribution, you're cutting people off from being able to do this. And I think it's um, morally wrong, and I think it's something that's, that's also a detriment to you know, the world. It, it, it cuts off innovation. I mean, if you think about you know, biological evolution, if there was somebody you know, standing over the primordial ooze and saying, OK, you make the cut, you make the cut, I think you can sell, you make the cut, you know, we'd still be in the primordial, primordial ooze. Um, but that's exactly what goes on in these different industries, especially the game industry, up until, up until now. Um, somebody is, owns those means. Somebody has to grant you access. Somebody has to, to enable you to be able to do that. Um, and like I said, this is, this is something that's happened in, in industries for a long time. Uh, movies, music, games... And all of these different industries have really followed the same path. And games are finally starting to fall into the same, same category. And what I want to talk about now is a little bit of history of independent film. Because up until uh, this guy came onto the scene, for the most part, movies were the same as games, uh, game distribution was. You had to be part of the studio system. You had to use their equipment. They would dis- distribute your your work of art. Um, it probably wouldn't be your work of art at all because they've already chosen what it's going to be and how you're going to proceed with it. Um, so what happened in the 60s was this guy came along, and this is John, John Cassavetes. Um, and what he did was he would act in big studio films, and then he would take the money that he made from those big studio films and he would turn around and use them to buy his own cameras and film his own movies and distribute his own movies. So he is um, credited with starting the independent film um, genre and movement. Um, He basically infiltrated that uh, studio system and then used their money to fund his own endeavor. You might recognize him because he was the actor that played the husband in Rosemary's Baby. So he was in a bunch of um, studio films, but more to his credit, he he started off this movement. He created something called um, Cinema Verite, which is truthful cinema, which is you know roughly equivalent to independent cinema. And you can really tell the impact that he had because around the 70s, they started to mimic the style of the films that he was um, he was creating. So the studios ended up coming back and you know using his influence. Um, so he really did change things. He opened the door so anybody can can make a movie. Anybody has the means to access the equipment. And then the same thing started to happen with music as well. You know, anybody can go out and buy recording equipment. Um, anybody can record themselves. Anybody can, you know, for the most part, put it on media. Distribution was still a little bit, little bit tricky, but you could do the same thing. And you think about that, that also turned the industry on its ear. You know, when, that, when independent music started to really hit in the 90s, that, that really shifted things around, and the, stu- um, the record labels started to you know, really, really respond to that. 
Now, what ended up happening with music in particular is um, around 10 years ago, Apple introduced the iTunes Music Store, uh, which for music, this was a big thing because no longer did you still have to go back to a record label for promotion and distribution. As long as you had a bank account and a name, you could go up, sign up, put your music out there, um, essentially eliminating the record label as a middleman. You saw it at Apple as a middleman, but they would just take a 30 um, 30% cut off of what you sold. So this opened the doors. Anybody could now record, anybody could distribute, and the floodgates were open on that industry. And over the years, uh, Apple and many others had opened up the same kind of conduit for applications and therefore games. So uh, when the iPhone hit, Apple opened it up and anybody, eventually they opened it up, and anybody could publish um, applications, games. Google has the same kind of thing. Amazon has the same kind of thing. Sony has the same kind of thing. So finally, you know, for the first time, um, just like in these other industries, you as independent individuals that have a dream of making a game, you can make that game and you can publish it yourself. You don't have to go to um, one of the big publishers and say, hey, I want to publish this game. You're free to do that yourself. Um, so you own the means of distribution. What's also happening is you also own the means of production as well. So over the past few years, um, there's also been a, a surge in the tools that are available to every person that's out there, regardless of whether you, you know, you don't have to go to Sony anymore and say, hey, I need a dev kit for the PS3 and beg and pay them a lot of money to get that. You can get tools that are um, in some cases, freely available for you to be able to use um, and build your own game. So I'll get this, um, get this one taken care of first because I think it's probably the one that everybody knows. This is an application called Unity. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, but you can use it to, of course, make your own games. And so over the years, this, is, this application really, it started off as um, the Mac's answer to uh, Torque, which is a game um, development uh, IDE that was out. And this was Mac only, and they borrowed a, a lot of the interface um, look and feel from Apple products, Final Cut Pro. Um, yeah, they've, they started off with a really solid product. They could publish to uh, Mac and Windows, and they had their own web plugin that you could publish to. Um, so they really had all the bases covered, and that's kind of the key to these tools is, you know, the tools are free, but on the other side of things, you have to make sure that they publish to the platforms that you want to be able to target. And so Unity has kept up with that, you know, as far as their feature set and their publishing platforms um, to a, the highest degree. So you can make a game in Unity, and you can publish to any, almost any platform that's available. You can publish to uh, um, Game Boy, you can publish to Nintendo DS, you can... 3DS, uh, Vita, Xbox, PlayStation, Mac, Windows, iPhone, Android. I mean, this thing handles all of it. Um, and the pricing on it is well within reason because um, you can start off free with it. And as you start to sell, then that's when you start to pay money into it. But really low barrier of entry, you can start off with this. And for years, I mean, this is such a good product that was started by you know a bunch of independent guys that had no ties to a big company, um, I was pretty sure that somebody was going to buy them. I mean, I thought, you know, Apple's going to buy them, Microsoft is going to buy them, Adobe's going to buy them, somebody's going to buy these guys. And they, they never were bought. They, they held out. And I think it's because just like their brothers at Snapchat, they knew that they had technology that was going to change the world. So they wouldn't sell out that technology for any price. No, but... Um, in all seriousness, it is you know the um, predominant platform for 3D games. They just introduced support for 2D games, finally. Um, so this is really something that, that you as an individual can use to make your own games. And it's not just individuals that are using it. Big studios are using it to make games as well. This is DuisX on iOS. Extremely well-crafted um, game, really good, uh, built in Unity. So, so it's no slouch. It can handle... Um, anything you want to throw at it. But let's say you do want something that can handle um, things a little bit uh, bigger in your mind. There is also 
uh, availability of the Unreal Engine that you can use to make games. And the Unreal Engine is the engine that has been used for games like Bioshock, um, Infinity Blade on iOS, Gears of War. Um, at, at this point, I'll mention that things in the presentation are coming full circle. If you know the person who was in charge of Gears of War, Cliff Belinsky or Cliffy B, he, um, in that first issue of Nintendo Power that came out, he actually had the top score listed for um, Super Mario Brothers. So, fun fact. Um, but Gears of War, or, or I'm sorry, uh, Unreal Engine is once again, uh, you can download it, you can start using it, same tools that the, the big companies use. Um, and it targets almost every platform out there. It targets iOS, it targets Android, um, of course it targets the consoles. This is actually the Unreal Engine running in a JavaScript port in uh, Firefox. So it's really, you know, there's not very many limits on what you can publish for and what you can run these games in. Um, so now you're at the point where, you know, you have the tools to build your game. Now you need to create some of the uh, models and animations for it. So now you, you have to break out your credit card because you're going to have to shell out some money, some coin to go out and buy Maya, right? Because that's what you're going to buy to animate and bake your textures and all that stuff. Um, what you can do instead is you can go out and for free download um, an application called Blender. So Blender started off as, you know, the, the, the target of Blender was to create um, open source tooling to uh, build CG movies and scenes. And one of the things that Blender never really did, did well, and I'm sure the people at Blender would appreciate me saying this, is the, the render quality was never that good. So the cinema rendering quality just wasn't. Um, ever on par with some of the bigger um, packages that were out there. But what it was really good at was a free modeler that anybody can download, anybody can use, and then also animate your models and apply textures to them, bake your textures, and export them for your game. So this supports most of the major model formats, um, and it's free, free to use. So once again, you know, no barrier of entry. Really, the only barrier of entry with Blender is trying to figure out how the interface works, because it's a little bit of a mess, but... Um, but another thing that Blender has baked in is a few years ago they put in their own um, game dev tools. So you can script in Python and write your own games in Blender. Um, and for 3D games in particular, they, and for pre-rendered scenes, they use a, a physics engine that's called Bullet 3D. So Bullet 3D is the next thing I want to talk about. It's a 3D physics engine. And this was the engine that Sony... Um, funded and had a hand in and built to work um, or to build games for the PlayStation 3. So once again, this is a really um, pretty elaborate, high-performing uh, 3D engine. And once again, it's an open source project. It's free, it's available, and it's ported to almost every platform. There's an iOS port of this. There's, um, there's a... a um, I, sorry, iOS. Of course, it runs on PlayStation 3. It runs on everything. Um, there's a plugin that you can use it in Unity as your as your 3D engine, as your 3D physics engine. Sorry. And there's even a port that runs in web browser. So this is Bullet 3D running a Blender scene um, in a web browser. So once again, the reach is out there. The barrier of entry is extraordinarily low, um, which is a great thing. And just to reiterate that you know, Bullet 3D is, is no slouch either, um, I was recently reading a uh, Wikipedia article about you know, arguably one of the better games to come out this year is Grand Theft Auto V. And it, it's just a, an extremely well-crafted game um, in almost every aspect, uh, regardless of the controversy that surrounds it. Um, and one of the things that's amazing about it is the environment is just um, such a great simulation. And what I noticed was, I, I always knew that they used an engine called Euphoria, which is one that you can license and use, use on your own as well. Um, but what I found out reading this article is, is that Euphoria didn't give, um, didn't give uh, Rockstar everything they needed for this game, so they actually pulled in Bullet 3D and used that to supplement their um, physics engine. So there's Bullet Physics right there. So this game that's just completely phenomenal, you know, a lot of the physics simulation that happens in it is because of bullet, bullet physics, bullet 3D. And this is something that's, once again, available and attainable to every individual, um, regardless of their access or not. Um, so the last tool that I want to talk about 
that you can use to, to play games is I'm going to dial it back, and instead of talking about a 3D engine, I'll talk about um, a 2D engine. And this is also one that's highly used, as ported to everything on the planet, JavaScript, ActionScript, um, iOS. It's out there for everything. And this is uh, Box2D. So Box2D is a 2D physics engine, so instead of working in three dimensions, it works in two dimensions. And the thing that's uh, um, great about it is, is, like I said, it's ported to every platform. It's pretty easy to use. And there's a game out there that you might have heard of that's called Angry Birds. And this is the physics engine that um, they use to create Angry Birds. And once you start using this engine, it's just remarkable how little Roxio did <laughs> to create such a, such a um, well-selling game. Um, so where does this leave us, and where does this leave um, me as an individual that you know, grew up with all these constraints? Well, it leaves all of us in almost a golden age. Um, we're going through the same renaissance right now that um, all the other industries went through, so music, film... Uh, finally, individuals can not only build their own game using the tools that I just talked about, so you own the means to be able to create your own game, um, but you can also distribute um, to different platforms. And it goes beyond being able to distribute. You know, even if you were building for a platform and designing for a platform, you still had to jump through hurdles to just get it to actually run on the device, which I think to me that was the hurdle that always made this so mystical to me, made it something that I wanted to be able to achieve was just getting it to run on that device. Um, but you enter um, things like the iPhone, and that takes those burdens away. I mean, it completely breaks down that barrier. You can um, pay a nominal price for a dev kit, or you can build stuff that games that run in the web browser on this. Um, and you can put your games on this device. You can just plug it into your computer and put stuff on there. No elaborate um, tools needed. It's a really easy process. So looking at these, I mean, these are really the newer versions of these devices are on par with current-gen console hardware. I mean, they have the same kind of capabilities. So it's really remarkable that you now have access to build and deploy and distribute for these platforms that are, you know, handheld versions of consoles. It's really cool. Now, the thing that um, stinks about these is virtual controls are just terrible. Um, if used to try and create a platformer, you know, a lot of times they're just not that, that good. Um, but a lot of vendors, and specifically for iOS and iOS 7, um, a lot of vendors are starting to alleviate that by coming out with game pads. So this is a Logitech game pad that's coming out actually in a week, supposedly. Um, for iOS 7 devices, and you plug the, the iPhone into it, and it basically becomes a really powerful, um, fully featured, handheld gaming device, which is really cool. So up until this point, and it'll be interesting to see how this, this changes things, one of the main platforms that's really been gathering a lot of steam um, for independently published, published games has been the PlayStation Vita. And this kind of has it all. It has, you know elements of a, of a um, mobile phone. It has touch. Um, it's very powerful. The screen is great. But then it's also got the physical controls with it. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. And Sony had a really hard time getting any big studios to publish content for this. So what they ended up doing was they turned around to independent game publishers and opened it up to them. And a lot of them have seen really good successes on, on this platform in particular. Because I think you know, that kind of game marries up with this personal portable device extremely well. So once again, this is a, a console. This is you know, the modern equivalent of a Game Boy. And you or I can go out and make a game and put it on this device. And there's been numerous um, independent games, Limbo, Hotline Miami. Um, this was a really good one. It's Thomas, uh, Thomas Was Alone. It started off as a Flash game that somebody made to explore um, friendship and gameplay mechanics. And then he ported it to Unity, and by doing that, then he was able to um, almost you know, push-button publish it to all these different platforms, including um, Vita, which uh, he's been extremely successful on there. So this leaves us at a point in time where, like I said, I think we're you know, firmly in some of the points of renaissance that have been seen in other um, mediums, other industries, where we finally 
are in control of the way that we make games. We can put them on the devices ourselves. We can distribute ourselves. We can um, publicize ourselves, which is a huge thing. Um, so looking back on it in the context of you know, when, when I had this dream of, of um, making my own game, it's night and day. I mean, it, there are no barriers anymore. And that's the thing that makes me so enthusiastic about this. Using you know, a mobile device or a Game Boy as a litmus test, you know, now I can make a game for that. And so that's why I'm so excited about it. That's what makes me enthusiastic about it. And I, I, I hope by putting this lens on it, you can see that how this journey for me um, has come to this point. And um, even if you weren't involved with having a Game Boy or weren't an extreme nerd like me, um, you can see you know, how... Uh, revolutionary this this time period is and how revolutionary it can be. Um, so this is me in the 80s giving my fist pump in the air because I'm so excited and I'm so happy that we finally finally reached this point. So, um, so that's it. Uh, I think uh, we're open or going to open to questions now. So... Um, what we'll do is... Uh, uh, you can raise your hand, and then I think Corey's going to come around with a with a mic. Um, is is that the way it's going to? Yeah. Okay. At least what I know. Of. Sorry. So what are you doing now? What am I doing now? Um, I'm actually working in the research institute at Nationwide Children's. So I don't. There's interactive elements of what I do, um, and there's a um, some things that I work on that are of course targeted towards towards kids and a good way to address children is through um, gaming. Um, so there's some things that I work at that or work on that have aspects of that. So what what would you say I guess uh, is was the breaking point for you as far as like the point in time where you was you felt like you needed to get your life over here. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to find you. Sorry. Uh, Can you repeat the question? I was too busy trying to <laughs> trying to locate you. I guess what was the breaking point or the starting point for you in your life where you felt like you needed to get your uh, career in motion, I guess, or what was the point in time where it was like you were tired of just the guy sitting on the sidelines and you wanted to get into the game, I guess? Um, I think it was more of an opportunity thing. It wasn't... Um, I would say that, that I wasn't somebody who was necessarily trying to get a... a direct job and a career in the game industry. Because um, at the time when I came out of school, that was something that still wasn't very um, attainable. Because there wasn't uh, this proliferation of game companies all over the place. You know, there, there wasn't really anything in Columbus. You had to go elsewhere to be able to get that. Um, but opportunities have presented themselves uh, over the years, and I've tried to gravitate towards them as much as possible. So, like I said, even though you know I don't work at a game company, and there's elements that I've positioned myself in in my career to be able to work on things that are very game game like. So, um, what would be your advice to someone who is currently in education? Um, like in the process of learning, like step by step, like from the ground up, how to make games. Like, where, huh. if you were in the position of a student, what would you want to be doing? Very good question. Um, what what kind of education are we talking about? Um, like simulations and computer programming. Oh, okay. Um, one of the things that that I encountered was that there wasn't an immediate uh, course of education that would apply to making games at that time. Now it's different. Now there are, um, now there are courses of education that you can go into. Um, but it's still, there's never going to be a, a courses that you can take that will teach you everything. I think my best advice to you is um, go to school, take those courses, learn everything you can from them, but also on the side, um, have two or three projects that you're working on on your own and do that for yourself because that's where you're going to learn the most. You're going to work on those projects, you're going to fail miserably at them, but you're going to be driven to finish them so you'll start them over again. And that's where you know, you're going to learn 75% of what you need to know from that versus what you're learning learning in school. So
heard rumors of the forthcoming uh, board game version of Big Doug. <laughs> Could you elaborate on that? Um, so, this is John Geiger. I've known him for years, and I've learned almost everything I know from, from John. And he's speaking later today, so make sure you make it to his presentation, because it's going to be awesome. And what he's referring to is, is that a few years ago, I mentioned to him that um, one of the other games that I had designed was, uh, um, since I, you know, once again, didn't have a way that I could you know, make a game that was like Dig Dug. Dig Dug was one of my favorite arcade games. So I made a board game version of Dig Dug. So, yeah. So, and once again, you know, that hasn't been licensed by anybody, so I've got some paperwork in the back if anybody wants to, wants to sign, so. Yeah. Just the personal suggestion from yourself, um, would you actually, from your game design and you know the ideas that you have for games, would you actually lean towards making four games and physical versions of a game beforehand to actually get your idea onto not just a piece of paper with a description, but more of, well, here's what it's like to you know enjoy the game and then working onto your, um, getting it onto the consoles um, that you plan on distributing? That's that's a really good question because board games and especially more elaborate ones have everything that makes a good video game as well. Um, I think you know what you get into with creating a board game is more of coming up with an elaborate rule set and a method of gameplay, which in a lot of cases that's things that games really video games really end up lacking. So I think it, it is a good um, segue to it, and I think it, it can lead to that. I'm surprised that you don't see that more often. I mean, there's a lot of people that make um, board games and you know card games and those kind of things that. You, that don't ever make that transition. And I think it might be more that they don't... Um, I mean, it's completely different building a video game versus building a board game, so they don't know how to bridge, to bridge that gap or they don't know who to trust to help them bridge that gap. But I do think there's a lot of opportunity there for taking things that are board games right now and they would make great, um, great video games, especially on touch devices. I think those are... Um, that type of device would be perfect for a lot of the uh, really good board games that are out there. So, are you part of the? I, I didn't know this until recently, but I guess Columbus is one of the hotbeds of board game and physical game design. Are you part of that? Or? No, I have yeah. a couple of associates that are really into that, and I was just wondering whether I should be backing up and slowing down on my you know programming and developing and eventual game technology and learning how to do board games first to get my design idea mm. concrete and moving forward in the game design. I think you should do them both at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <love> it is. <laughs> thank you, Jeremy. All right, thank you.